It's my pleasure to introduce Jan Schwab uh, from Ohio State University. Uh, he, he has a, a number of important jobs at OSU. He's the medical director for the Belford Center for Spinal Cord Injury. He's also the program director for the Ohio Regional Spinal Cord Injury Model System. Uh, he uh, received his medical training in, at the University of Tübingen uh, slightly before the turn of the last millennium into the new millennium. And while he was there, he was exposed to the amazing scientists in the Max Planck Institute uh, there who, who were a world-class uh, developmental neuroscientists who discovered among other things, the way efferents control axon guidance in, in the nervous system. And they inspired him to consider including research in what he was going to be doing in the future. And he became very efficient at it very quickly and started receiving awards kind of out of the box. Uh, he's uh, trained as a neurologist and since 2004 has been the scientific director for the Wings for Life Spinal Cord Foundation. Uh, he has received uh, many awards. I'm not gonna go through all of them. Maybe just the, the most recent one that I see on his CV is the Apple Award from the American Spinal Injury Association. He's interested in, in various uh, uh, issues related to spinal cord injury, especially uh, inflammation and uh, the immune system. Uh, but he's uh, published very uh, kind of, from our perspective, kind of basic studies, or, uh, looking at row signaling in response to CSPGs uh, and, and other, th other things like that. He has many highly cited papers. For a long time, he's been very interested in uh, trying to, make sure that the kind of work that goes on in labs like ours here at the Miami Project it, using animal models or in vitro models are actually relevant to the kind of issues that are present that he sees in the clinic. And so I consider him a thought leader in this area. And when he, when he uh, gives a talk or publishes a paper on this, I, I, I make sure I read it so I can try and incorporate his thinking into how we're operating in the lab. Uh, recently, uh, January this, this year, he published a paper in Nature Reviews with Kareem, our friend Kareem Fouad, Phil Popovich and Marcel Koop on the neuroanatomical functional paradox in spinal cord injury. And in this paper, uh, he, they discuss kind of the, the, the their kind of injuries that we're never gonna be able to help at least with 2021 technology, there's some, uh, a sweet spot where we may be able to think that we're going to be able to help them. And then there are people who are going to probably recover on their own. Uh, and so we need to be able to identify those people. And, and then we need to make sure that our animal models are relevant to those kinds of injuries. So uh, when I read the paper, I talked it over with John and Dalton, and, and we thought it would be wonderful to have him come in and talk about his latest thinking in this really uh, important problem. So, uh, Jan, thank you for taking time out from your clinical service today to give this presentation to us. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much um, um, for this uh, very, very nice introduction. and. Um, uh, dear John, um, uh, dear Dr. Dietrich, also uh, here, Dr. Bixby, thank you for having me here, uh, joining the, uh, the Gale Beach Memorial Lecture uh, series. Um, as, I, as I learned, um, uh, Ms. Beach has a teacher, has been a teacher herself who sustained a spine cord injury. So um, I hope it's appropriate to present here within the series a, a new concept uh, with relevance to spine cord injury, particularly with regard to translation and upcoming um, uh, clinical trials. So um, I don't have any particular disclosures to make. I'm sitting here in front of you because exactly when was contacting me and saying, well, um, this paradox seems to be interesting, but it's uh, for sure very complicated. Um, so my job here today is um, to explain the underlying rationale of this uh, paradox uh, uh, more um, and also um, illustrate it and also uh, go further uh, and uh, saying for what it could be good for um, uh, in understanding spinal cord injury better 
of course, also, um, this is also to address questions at the end of the talk you, you may have. Um, <clears throat> before I'm going into that, I would like to mention my uh, colleagues working on that for quite some time, actually five years um, now, um, Karim Fuad, uh, Phil Popovich, and, and Marcel Kopp. Um, and for those of you who are interested to dig a little bit further, also going towards the references, uh, please feel free to do so. This um, work was published as a as a, as a perspective article uh, just rather recently. So in the next few minutes, I would like to give you an introduction on this neuroanatomical functional paradox. Um, I will illustrate uh, contributing elements. Um, I will put some uh, emphasis on the non-linearity of lesion volume and associated deficits. I will introduce to you also the, the concept of eloquence, which is already in clinical use uh, in neurosurgery. I will also explain um, uh, reasons why the initial lesion uh, volume um, or lesion severity may um, be altered uh, in terms of its predictive value for chronic outcomes, because there could be transient phenomena which occur actually after the injury has been taken place with regard to either transient recovery or also transient uh, injury. Um, then I will remodel or will model this um, paradox here together with you uh, by means of a, a well-known clinical um, a feature in spine cord injury patients, the so-called zone of partial preservation. And last but not least, I give you here tangible clinical examples on how this um, here um, uh, anatomical functional paradox might look alike. Well, the starting point uh, getting into that is actually that the field has the uh, spinal cord injury field has emerged from a field focusing mostly on, on fundamental uh, basic science questions over the last uh, you know, three decades. Um, towards now uh, early translation, we see that with cellular therapies to which also the NIMI uh, project has made crucial contributions on how to do that in the spinal cord. Um, also, we see, um, as I would label them as first generation potential plasticity enhancers being tested now, um, uh, interfering with the NOGO pathway, um, either uh, interfering with NOGO receptor, but also with NOGO R molecules. Um, both therapies are being applied intrathecally. Of course, <clears throat> we, we, do not know, we do not know the outcome yet of this, in particular with regard to efficacy, but um, it clearly, um, despite being early days, uh, here the field is moving towards uh, translation, and there's a need to translate and that this can be a difficult or failure prone process has already been alluded to by, by Vance. And we know that um, um, for quite some time uh, as being shown uh, nicely at the time with sobering results here from the S for SCI uh, initiative. Here also uh, Miami project has been involved with, with Dr. Dietrich. Do you see my, my cursor actually here on this? Okay, that's great. Um, um, and this is not a problem at all, specific for uh, spinal cord injury research. Of course, as you very well know, this is also being a substantial obstacle also in, in stroke, and there are still ongoing um, here uh, yeah, analysis trying to find actually where, where the problem is. A big problem here in translation lies in, in the amount of bias, which is introduced already very early at the bench side. There are several sorts of bias. Also, the spinal cord injury field is uh, affected uh, having this kind of bias. And I give you just one example about the dimension of bias. Here, this is about selection bias. We can deal with selection bias by blinding uh, here um, the outcome um, and um, or the observer. Um, and um, here, what you can see here is um, uh, in a meta-analysis, including more than 9,000 uh, animals with more than 500 experiments, which was also published rather recently, that in those uh, actually experiments where there is no blinding, that this is associated with an inflated effect size by about 8%. So significantly uh, optimistic or elevated inflated effect sizes in case there's no blinding on board. Um, what does this now imply? Well. Of course, if you would like to um, follow up with clinical trials, they will be underpowered because they will assume for far too, again, optimistic effect sizes. Also, if you would like to reproduce those effects, of course, you would have also a, a higher chance for no reproduction because these effect sizes are in reality much, much uh, lower. This is just one example. There are many other of different sources of bias. 
Um, a big one also is, of course, um, the um, publication bias that not all of the data are out there in the public domain. Another problem is that the um, published results are hardly comparable, and this has here um, taken up by Vance Lemon already early in 2014, here proposing a, a catalog of, of, of characteristics uh, which should then define an experiment and makes that actually better comparable. And I guess importantly, these efforts then also sparked uh, initiative like, like the Open Data Common Initiative, which we see right now and which is rather unique here for the field of spine cord injury. But these are things which you uh, already know. There might, however, be also a neurobiological reason which can contribute for unexplained variability, posing a translational challenge as such, and also with that enhance the risk for non-reproduction. So uh, let me introduce you now to this uh, paradox. I guess it's quite obvious. This is uh, here in terms of how we do things. Um, um, we here uh, create lesions in our models or we look in patients with lesions and we assume that the lesion volume somewhat, of course, is defining the, the deficit and the paralysis. And as a neurologist, of course, this is really a big part of, of, of what we are doing. And with that, we are kind of also <clears throat> assuming that there is linearity indicating that the more severe a lesion would be also that the more severe the deficit or the paralysis would be. That it is not that uh, simple um, actually has been shown in, in related uh, fields. If you look now here, for example, in the field of non-SEI um, pathology, basically the field of multiple sclerosis, it's very well known that only every ninth lesion will cause symptoms. So the first eight lesions remain neurologically silent. And this has been uh, taken further actually um, by uh, Friedrich Barkov, who actually coined this uh, clinical radiological um, paradox. And um, um, this is not just um, proposing or saying, he was actually doing a lot of analysis um, here uh, to support that. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, and he was quoting that the association between clinical findings and the radiological extent of involvement is generally poor. He further concludes, oops, sorry. okay, I need to, something different here. He further con concluded that, um, that much progress has been made to improve or optimize MRI techniques. So the clinical radiological dissociation indeed proved to be a true paradox. Importantly, also in the uh, animal model of MS, the EIE model, uh, this uh, discrepancy shows as well. So there's a discrepancy between disease burden visualized in, uh, by MRI and the extent of disability, which mimics the human uh, clinical radiological paradox. So we actually have actually a problem which exists on both sides, on the, uh, on the animal model side, but also in the human condition. And, with that, it's even more relevant because it can skew effect sizes both at the bench and the bedside. And despite this relevance, it's actually not really being addressed so far, and it's also not necessarily well understood. <clears throat> so it is clearly intuitive to um, anticipate linearity or correlation uh, of lesion size and outcome, but is this now really likely a biological principle? If you just take one step back and maybe go to the most yeah, profound or uh, basic here, uh, uh, neuroscientific here uh, phenomenon, the action potential. Clearly, this is not, not linear at all. We, we just have to change the membrane potential by about uh, here 20 uh, millivolt, and then this will then trigger an all or nothing response um, here of the action potential. So clearly, this is not indicative of, of linearity. Is this now applicable to spine cord injury? Well, <clears throat> Of course, um, we model spinal cord injury, um, and we still hope that um, our outcomes and our anatomical readouts are somewhat uh, uh, linear. So we, we count axons which are crossing the lesion site, or we look for spared um, white matter surrounding the lesion, <clears throat> and hoping that the, the more, the better. Um, is this, however, now relating to function? And then this becomes actually more, more difficult. Um, and um, particularly <clears throat> now with that being said, I would like to introduce you now to this neuroanatomical functional paradox here in spinal cord injury. And this is work done by, um, by Karim Fuert, um, um, 
far earlier, um, uh, published actually in experimental neurology the first time. You can here see here two different lesions uh, on the left and here on the right, um, which differ with the amount of uh, injured tissue here in gray. Um, here on the right side, you have a lesion uh, covering about 84%, whereas here on the left side, it's only 54% in these two lesions. However, when you look for the outcome, as we do it, we do BBB scoring, <clears throat> actually they're identical. Also, if you look here, for example, here at the grid, grid walking score, they're very, very similar. So <clears throat> this in a way already hints towards that the relationship between lesion size and the functional deficit cannot be just simply linear. Um, Karim uh, went ahead and um, proposed an, uh, an alternative. Um, and here we look at the lesion size plotted against the functional recovery. Um, and this would be a linear here relationship, the red line. And this is now what Karim has proposed, quite in line what has been already shown all same as that you can have quite a bit of actually damage to the cent central nervous system without causing here too much of functional impairment. However, when you reach here a certain stage, the slope changes, it becomes very, very steep, here reaching a sensitive uh, area. Um, and then the slope changes again um, here, uh, and you can add a lot of damage there too without any changing too much of the, of the recovery profile as such. So in a way, the slope defines different areas of eloquence um, uh, where same size, same sized lesions would produce considerable different defects. So this would be here an area of low eloquence. This would be an area of high eloquence, and this would be again a one of low eloquence. Just to illustrate it, if you would have, for example, a perfect neuroprotective agent, which would be able to spare twenty percent of your lesion here, um, and you would be able here to reduce the lesion from here just by neuroprotection. The functional implication would be still very, very little. However, if you would be able to do that here in this particular region, yes, then of course, this would cause a tremendous implication with, with regard to improving uh, function. <clears throat> Is there any <clears throat> clinical example um, supporting that? Yes, of course, uh, there are actually many. I give you here just one um, here from, from stroke. Um, here indicating a high eloquent region. Again, this would be here in this particular area. <clears throat> and this relates here to so-called thalamic infarcts or needle pin infarcts, which uh, here affect the capsula interna. So they produce massive or extensive functional defects despite being rather, rather small. And even there can be a so-called needle pin. You can hardly see that on the MRI, but having profound here uh, deficiency in, in locomotor function um, becoming visible. And this even then led to a question, um, uh, uh, John Krakauer from John, Johns Hopkins, actually the, the, the proportional recovery rule, which he uh, proposed earlier and, and um, indicated that probably there's something we, we are missing um, uh, making those uh, far less proportional. So yes, in stroke, we have kind of a similar uh, challenge. So what is this eloquence now about? Um, what is this principle, principle about? Well, this is about the functional relevance of a certain, for a certain task, which is encoded per tissue volume, so to speak. Um, can I make that a little bit more uh, clearer? Yeah, <clears throat> when I was, uh, actually training uh, to become a neurosurgeon at this time. <laughs> Long time ago, I was just speaking with Benz about it. I was here at the Memorial Sloan, Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, also then seeing patients um, as an intern at the time with brain uh, tumors. And what was what the neurosurgeons were doing at the time, they were asked the patient to read um, and basically speak. And then with that, uh, they do that uh, in an MRI, um, do bold uh, MRI functional testing, functional MRI there with both signal. And what you can then see is that, um, that these uh, language area are basically lighting up. You see them in the context also where the tumor is lying. And then with this information, the, the surgeon can choose a path going towards debulking the tumor without going through these eloquent language uh, areas. So this is really about eloquence. And <clears throat> in a way, this goes beyond also textbook knowledge, which can be wrong by the way, and uh, which anyhow um, is just having generalized proxies. Um, so it individualized in a way, uh, the mapping of, 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 
of, of functionality. And this has extended much more elaborate since since that that time where there was just bold MRI and there are different eloquent uh, qualities which you can now test for. This is now a brain tumor. Again, these are these regions you don't want to go through because this will then leave the patient with um, respective uh, deficits. So uh, in a way, <clears throat> really this is about differentiating um, regions of eloquence versus those uh, without. And interestingly, this eloquence has been only be defined or, or as conceptually being thought and, and used um, and applied in the brain, um, but it also applies to the spinal cord. So clearly, obviously, eloquence of a certain brain uh, here volume is defined by the tracts or circuitry uh, running through. How does this now apply to a spinal cord injury? And I'm not showing you just here a sketch of a, of a, of a rodent a spinal cord, and the task here is a forelimb uh, uh, grasping. Um, you can see here two different um, um, tracts which are responsible for, for, for that, um, helping doing that. Um, and um, here we have now two same sized lesion, lesion one and lesion two, again, the same size. Um, lesion one would spare this ventrolateral tract just affecting the corticospinal tract. Uh, a lesion two would actually affect uh, mostly both. And um, despite having now the same lesion volume, uh, animals with a lesion here type number one would uh, recover far better or has better odds to recover than those animals with a lesion here too. How does this apply now uh, with regard to human? Um, spine cord injury basically very similar. Um, here you can see the, um, the, the corticospinal tract. You can see here the reticulospinal tract. And again, two same size lesion, lesion two and three. Uh, lesion two would spare a considerable amount of this reticulospinal and corticospinal tract. And with that, um, actually lesion two would have much better chances for recovery uh, than lesion three where there is, is no sparing. And I should make it also clear that um, sparing is, is basically an incomplete lesion. Really the tracts are, are going through and this need to be differentiated from a so-called zone of partial preservation. As the name is saying, it's only partial. So the patient is still complete, but has some segmental innovation being remaining intact below the lesion side. Okay. <clears throat> So, um, so, so I would like now to introduce this uh, zone of partial preservation as another source of non-linearity between lesion size and outcome after uh, SCI in human. Uh, <clears throat> and this zone of partial preservation, you might have heard about it somehow, it's kind of a black box as it is being uh, at least described most of the times, um, very abstract. Um, and with this zone of partial preservation, make it a little bit less abstract and I would like to model this anatomical functional paradox here together with you, distinguishing here between lesion affected and recovery related networks after spinal cord injury. So here we have basically two different lesions and you're color coded, you see in red, this is, these are the lesion affected tracts here in green, you can see here these recovery related networks. This would be here the neurological level of injury. This is actually identical in these two lesions. Here in this light green, you can see the zone of partial preservation. So residual intact uh, uh, segmental uh, innovation below the lesion side. And, and you can see here in this area um, or in lesion number two or B, this zone of partial preservation is, is, is much larger. And this sort of partial preservation can be understood as a kind of a, as I said, spared segmental innovation, a kind of a connectivity space between the lesion affected and the recovery related network. So let's compare those two lesions. <clears throat> so they have a, the same amount of lesion affected tracts. So the initial deficit is, is will be very, very similar. Uh, the amount of uh, paralysis will be very similar. Um, however, uh, there is more segmental innovation, as I said here, in this lesion compared to that lesion. <clears throat> and with that, having a larger zone of partial preservation, the connectivity space between lesion affected and recovery related networks here is just bigger. So now, despite actually being a larger lesion, as you can see here in blue, <clears throat> 
here in this lesion B compared to lesion A, it still has better odds for recovery than a lesion A. As we know, and this is clinical evidence that patients with sonar partial preservation do better uh, with regard to their chances of recovery. So with that now, of course, this poses quite a challenge for biomarker studies, which would just you know, measure mostly lesion volume, but not the eloquence of a certain lesion volume. Going forward, um, and better under, to better understand that, um, it would make a lot of sense not necessarily to look for those lesion affected tracts or the recovery related networks in isolation, but rather looking actually for the connectivity between these two systems. So what I here now just gave you is actually an example of a paradoxical prediction. We have actually a larger lesion, which would be associated with a better recovery. And um, <clears throat> clearly this sort of partial preservation is, is an abstraction. It's a kind of a pattern purely deduced from, from, from the Inski score. Is there any way to understand how this really should, should look alike in anatomical terms? Well, its morphological representation is clearly, <laughs> well, it's unclear. Um, um, but however, now uh, candidate imaging biomarkers for this zone of partial preservation have at least been proposed. And uh, one of those is actually the so-called mid-sagittal bridge um, or mid-sagittal bridges. This is a concept being put forward by Armin Kurt and uh, Patrick uh, Freund. This is now here, a beautiful work here coming from Colorado. You can see here on this two-weighted two image, basically anterior here tissue bridge and a posterior one. And this then relates actually to the uh, total uh, cord uh, diameter here, here in green. And these bridges are yeah, potential anatomical spaces for connectivity between lesion affected and recovery associated network, again, potentially determining also the odds for plasticity. Um, with that, again, this is ongoing work and need to be, of course, consolidated further. Is this really now functional tissue or is this scar or something else? Of course, this is not an easy one um, to be continued, um, but at least conceptually, um, this is where it could happen that uh, these plasticity uh, uh, reservoirs are located. And of course, there's also plasticity above and below the lesion site, but in a way, these are the kind of bottlenecks to, to, to funnel that through. Okay, um, is there a role um, for that in experimental spinal cord injury for this concept? Well, I would assume um, yes, um, based on actually published experiments um, relating back to this four SCI reproduction series, um, briefly mentioned in the beginning of the talk. Here, there has been an intervention being tested, uh, which uh, was uh, aiming for reducing this hemorrhagic transformation um, after here a unilateral hit of the cord. You can see that here demarcated here. And um, <clears throat> this was then tried to be reproduced by a kind of a classical bilateral hit here from, from, from the back um, um, in the reproduction center, uh, reproduction site. However, it was not able to be reproduced. However, when then the reproduction site changed the injury paradigm, just here actually to the unilateral side, again, having importantly also this angled impact, um, this of course then resulted in different sparing of tissue. Um, the effect was reconstituted and even led to um, yeah, occurrence of, of functional effects uh, being detected again. So in this case, the lack of reproduction was based on the animal model with different amount of sparing and if just something like that also with a different amount of zone of preservation, possibly due to those different lesion models. So indeed this supports a role of this also in animal modeling, even though it's not necessary at all uh, here <laughs> investigated. Um, so now besides anatomical um, causes for non-linearity between lesion size and outcome, um, here I gave you two examples, distinct eloquence of tissue, also sort of partial preservation. The question, of course, are there other factors which could contribute to a dissociation between the initial lesion volume, which is usually then measured at baseline, and the outcome, which is then usually measured chronically. In a way, factors which could cause or contribute to a dissociation from the predicted outcome over time. And there are two ways or two possibilities. One relates to transient injury, and this is here plotted on the left side, or transient recovery. 
here on the left side, here the observed functional recovery can be greater than expected. Um, here and this mismatch is indicated in green. And this could be accounted for, for example, by the presence of reversible or transient axonal injury that resolves during the early part of recovery. Of course, this is a very theoretical concept. Far more clinical evidence is there um, supporting uh, the presence of transient recovery. Here, the transient recovery can result also in a mismatch between the degree of recovery predicted, this would be here the dotted line, and actually the final really achieved um, here, uh, recovery amount. And this transient recovery can or could be caused um, here by the emergence of actually systemic modifiers, which would kick in as a kind of a second hit uh, here uh, later. And one candidate to do so would be uh, spine cord injury um, associated infections, which could then impose as outcome modifying factors. Well, um, at least briefly, um, is there really now such a thing like transient axonal injury? It sounds really awkward um, and um, weird. Um, <clears throat> well, um, it has been described, um, however, with the precondition that the myelin sheath remains intact. And this again now is digging into the field of uh, EIE. Um, this was described early on by Hans Lassmann and Monika Badl and was then later uh, confirmed and verified by Thomas Miskeld and Martin Kerschensteiner. It was then renamed focal axonal damage. You can see this normal axon, which can then uh, here uh, show early sign or milder signs of this focal axonal damage, which would then classify as grade number one. And then you can see here this caliber changes or axonal varicosis to occur. Um, if this is actually even extended further, the integrity of the axon becomes lost and this would then here be a stage two um, axon uh, damage. Importantly, a stage one is reversible, stage two is not. So here this would be reversible, this would be not, and this has then been commented by, commented by others as well. The driver for this injury here is not trauma, it is actually um, yeah, inflammation or macrophages, um, chronically activated macrophages, which could change the also the mitochondria and the axon itself. And again, to a milder degree, um, um, just reaching here a stage one, this would be then again uh, reversible. Does this in principle or could this apply also to um, spinal cord injury pathology? In principle, yes. Of course, as we do see also here, activated macrophages in the surrounding rim um, of the lesion um, for quite some time. And the implications of that are nicely illustrated, um, being of course a, a field of intense investigation now looking for molecules who could help us to learn more about these kind of macrophage subpopulations. Here, this is early work by Phil Popovich, where he um, introduced um, through a, a non-traumatic uh, here path the um, uh, an immune stimulant, an innate immune stimulant uh, here, which resulted in the accumulation here of macrophages. And you can see that uh, here, almost like a photonegative, uh, the uh, neurites um, are completely spared um, from that uh, region of macrophage accumulation indicating, and this was the naming at the time, that these macrophages indeed could work or could act like inflammatory scalpels um, in line, at least with what have been proposed here uh, before. So yeah, um, it could be there, but of course there's not really uh, further evidence um, available. Could it also have a role in human spine cord injury? Um, a priori, probably, uh, yes. This is work published rather recently um, by Romana Höfberger in Vienna, where she also assesses uh, human and tissue. We compare here a lesion rim and the lesion core. Um, at the lesion rim, you can see this already very early, I should say, from four to 21 day after spinal cord injury. You can see this classical retraction bulbs here are being formed. Also, again, here this axonal varicosis, this caliber changes of the axon uh, throughout. And yes, of course, in the lesion rim, there are also a lot of macrophages. So the players are there, which could indeed entertain such a phenomenon like uh, reversible, at least in the light, in the early stage, reversible axonal axon injury. In the chronic stage here, this is, um, you know, uh, here spinal cord fall later. You can see a cyst has been formed here as well, um, here demarcating um, the, the core. Um, and here, this would be actually Corresponding to that picture, here would be actually the cyst. And you can also see here, even chronically, of course, there is a macrophage activation present. And <clears throat> these uh, non resolving macrophages have been described far earlier, um, actually, work done by uh, Dr. Fleming and uh, 
uh, in Beaver at the time, uh, Dr. Nornberg and also um, uh, Dalton Dietrich was involved. Here we look at the spinal cord, um, C6 lesion uh, here with an H and E stain. You can see here this paler uh, lesion and you can see that surrounding actually the lesion there is this activated macrophage response, an accumulation of macrophages remaining there for a long time. So indeed this chronically macrophages um, here even could entertain this phenomenon uh, here of, of, of um, axonal uh, injury even long term. Okay, and now <clears throat> shifting gears to the other transient uh, phenomenon, which could actually be for, their, for which there's actually more evidence, not transient axonal injury, but transient recovery. Again, to, dis to explain the dissociation between the initial decent severity and, and, and chronic outcome. And I will give you here two examples, one relating here to experimental SCI, and the other one would be for the clinical uh, constellation. <clears throat> here, this is again referring to this meta-analysis uh, briefly introduced to you earlier. These are the effect sizes in percentage uh, of this intervention. You can see that actually the longer the animals are being followed, um, so with about two months after uh, SCI, these effect sizes become or start to become unstable. Um, they start to uh, fluctuate, indicating that um, these um, yeah, recovered uh, function um, here um, are not really uh, maintained. Um, how about human SCI? This is work done and published by Steve Kirschbaum. Here we are following um, patients, or he's following patients at one year uh, and then uh, uh, throughout then five years. And here you can see how these patients actually are um, looking alike um, in terms of AES grade. Um, so at one year one, you have a amount, good amount of patients here starting off, uh, and most of them actually stay um, here. Asia, A, here if you look for B patients, we can actually see negative conversions, um, a subgroup of those patients losing this function, converting to A negatively. If we start here with these patients at one year, looking at this C cohort uh, of patients, we can see that they are quite a amount of patients can deteriorate to become Asia A or B, or of course, likewise in analogy, those who start off as a, a D at year one can deteriorate to becoming Asia A, B or C. So this is a subpopulation which is actually worsening over time in line um, with yeah, transient recovery or unstable outcomes which are here occurring. And indeed, this is another um, hint um, for non-linearity in human SCI, at least if you consider lesion severity as a baseline a predictor. How can we put it now into a more integrative uh, scheme? Well, um, this is illustrated here, outcome variability and underlying causes. Again, this is what we're trying to do. We have the initial lesion severity and would like to predict outcome uh, later on. But of course, this approach ignores the variability which is introduced after, this is the time scale here, after the injury, which could actually impact on both uh, the lesion affected network, but also the recovery related network. There are also interspinal modifiers, as we see that in clinics sometimes that the patients bleed at the lesion site at delayed, in a delayed manner. So there's hemorrhagic transformation. Also this would then cause um, an impact on the neuroarchitecture, more swelling, uh, of course, interdual swelling, and then with that more interdual pressure and thereby also uh, more, 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 more injury. We do now know today that also um, outcome modifiers occur over time. Um, here, just to name a few, there's post-SCI hyperglycemia, which has shown to propagate, uh, which to be associated with propagated um, injury. There are hypotensive, but also hypertensive episodes, which can impair the capacity of the spinal cord uh, to repair. And there can also other effect uh, here, confounders like acquired infections, fever, which then cause metabolic derangement at, at, at the lesion size side. And uh, Dalton Dietrich made also very early on significant contributions to that topic. Also dysbiosis um, can be acquired after injury um, and at least in animal models has been associated with impaired recovery. So I would now um, <clears throat> give you some clinical examples, tangible, very visible examples, how this um, functional paradox could look alike. And this here is now a patient with a profound uh, syrinx being formed. This is a cervical spinal cord. This would be the cerebellum, the brain. You can see quite extensive syrinx formation, actually going even above or extending more rostral than the spinal cord, extending into um, 
um, here the modula oblongata and even the brain and the stem. This is then core here termed syringobulbia. Um, so if you see that type of MRI and you just see this very little um, modest um, spared spinal cord here in, in front or behind the cord, you would assume, well, this patient is likely a paraple is tetraplegic, um, cannot do much, but the patient was coming into my clinic walking, just having a little problem with dexterity and some ataxia, but otherwise he, he was fine. And um, I'm sure those of you who see those patients too um, have similar, um, I've seen similar actually findings with profound uh, neural loss, but still uh, yet preserved uh, function. So I would now here close with two uh, clinical examples from over time um, with spinal cord injury patients. This is now a 35-year-old male um, after a motorcycle accident. And very early on, here in this early MRI, you can see here this um, lesion being formed. Here you see the edema um, being demarcating, um, cysts being forming. Um, and here, this will be then the chronic here uh, appearance. This patient, unfortunately, has uh, started off being tetraplegic and remained tetraplegic. There is no a leg function and hand function. <clears throat> and I should say that this is uh, actually imaging uh, data coming from Armin Kurt and Patrick Freund I'm here sharing with you. Um, the other comparison I would like to make is here uh, illustrated. This is now a 36 year old uh, uh, male, so quite similar of age. Um, also here you can see a quite profound lesion early on, which has then evolved here over time and still profoundly here demarcated here with a the syringomyelia, and this patient, even though having started off as being tetraplegic, is now uh, able to work again uh, as a surgeon. Okay, um, I would like to, I, you know, and in a way this illustrates, of course, considerable different outcomes despite comparable lesion volume to start with. So I would like to summarize, um, I'm trying to convey here to you that perhaps surprisingly, um, Despite our or the exponent, exponential increase in our molecular knowledge of the mechanism really truly underlying neurological recovery have actually not yet been established. So and this points in a way to a substantial void in our neurobiological understanding. And this void, of course, also allows to introduce um, variability impeding the reproduction not again caused by other sources like how we do experiments with bias and the reporting of that. This is actually caused by unknown uh, neurobiology. So now besides uh, searching for new molecules, which is still an important essential task, um, also fundamental neurobiology awaits to be investigated as a real challenge or chance uh, necessary to get closer to successful translation. And um, this neurobiology of recovery as I would label it, is truly at the core of translational neuroscience and offers substantial room for um, discovery science. And we now would like actually to suggest or propose um, or nominate this uh, neuroanatomical functional paradox as one way um, to examine this neurobiology uh, of recovery in a, in a, in, in a way. Um, um, and we basically would look here at patients over or underperforming. Um, based upon their initial lesion size in a way doing outlier research to learn more about these trajectories of outcome. With this, I would like to um, understand why they happened. With this, I would like to close. Um, I would like to thank all my collaborators um, uh, accompanying me on this path here throughout the globe. Um, here uh, in Berlin, uh, Marcel, Marcel Kopp here at my uh, here clinical tra training, Alma Mater at the Charité, uh, my uh, uh, lab group here at Ohio State. I have the privilege to be at Ohio State now since about five years. Also here, my colleagues from the Belford Center for Spine and Cord Injury, Phil Popovich and Dana McTyke, all members of the Spine and Cord Injury Model System um, who helped to make that a successful enterprise. We have been fortunate to be funded for the first time here in 2016 as a Spine and Cord Injury Model System site. And of course, also all the funding agencies to help actually us doing the work that we are doing. A shout out also to my colleagues from the Spine Cord Injury Model System here in Miami, um, Mark Nash and David Gator, who run a very successful here module, 
um, studying um, cardiometabolic functions after spinal cord injury to which we have uh, to which we are also contributing and which is run very effectively. With this, I would like to uh, close and I'm very happy to take questions. Jan, uh, I have a, a couple of comments. That's you know, a very intriguing uh, set of ideas that you've presented. Just one comment about the zone of partial preservation. Mm -hmm. Up until 2019, it was only defined for complete AISA injuries. Uh, and it really predicted segmental recovery, did not really predict long-track recovery. In the 2019 revision, the definition has been changed to include uh, incomplete injuries. In terms of the nonlinearity, another thing I just wanted to ask you about is, you know, one of the things that we're learning is that the spinal cord itself has a lot of functional capabilities. And so, whereas we've always thought that we need a certain uh, quantity of supraspinal uh, information to get a certain outcome, it may be that we need only minimal supraspinal uh, uh, inputs to get an outcome because much of it is organized at the level of spinal cord circuits. So those are my two comments. Thank you. Uh, Christine. Hi, thank you so much for a fascinating talk. Really important uh, for us basic scientists to understand. Um, I, I guess I had a question um, regarding um, this functional paradox uh, in, in the context of your discussion of this sensitive versus insensitive um, lesion. Um, I guess uh, my first question is, should uh, we as scientists adapt our recruitment criteria for clinical trials um, in order to like take this into account? Should we be because um, as far as I know, at least for the Schwann cell trials, I believe lesion size was used as one of the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, so should, should we consider, you know, doing or including just the sensitive, quote unquote, sensitive lesions? Um, or is this like stacking the deck, so to speak? Um, well, important question, of course. So what is, what is the result of that paradox? Um, um, should we... Um not use lesion size anymore or, or severity. No, I guess I guess we should use that as an important information still, obviously, but this is by itself not self-explanatory. Um, 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 obviously there is a lot of variability still um, around um, here. So I guess what could be the consequence for doing animal um, research? Well, we could, one could, for example, also try to um, indeed go into this, um, area of, of trying to use also, you know, zone of partial preservation criteria for animals, which would be for sure different and they're not easy to do. But I guess that um, this would be probably one way to at least aiming at, 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 at having more robust um, understanding of, of the variability, you know, uh, which is again on both sides, on the clinical side and on the animal side. Yeah. Christine, did you have two questions or one? Um, yeah, and I did have a second one. Um, if you, um, when you're talking about like functional recovery, um, as far as I was aware, you were talking purely locomotor, um, or I, I wasn't sure if you meant autonomic. And if if so, is does autonomic recovery follow the same kind of um, or follow the same uh, paradox that that local locomotor recovery is is following? So I simplified and, and basically only um, here refer to uh, locomotor recovery. Um, it might also play a role for other systems as well, but you know, to illustrate the thought, I just you know, focused on, on, on locomotor function. John? Uh, John, thanks, that was a great talk. I really uh, appreciated the thinking. Um, I have kind of, uh, two questions that I'll try to wrap into one so it's not to be accused of asking too much. Uh, and they, they both concern this idea of tissue bridges. So mm -hmm. uh, you know that Court and Freund have uh, proposed that the existence of these bridges can be used as a way to stratify patients in clinical trials uh, if, if one does uh, the things cleverly enough. And I, I'm wondering how you react to that, first of all. And secondly, 
Do you think that there's something analogous that happens in animal models like rats and mice that people like us should be aware of and maybe take into account? Um, with regard to the, the first question, um, I guess it's too early to say. Um, obviously, there need to be more data um, and um, there need to be also multi-center um, verification of this tissue bridge um, um, prediction. Um, I guess going forward and, and you know, correlating patients um, with tissue bridges or, or basically maybe starting off with patients having a certain lesion and which are outperforming or underperforming based on their initial lesion size and then looking for whether there's a tissue bridge or not in those patients would be one way to get closer to that, I would agree. Um, whether it works, I don't know, um, but it, it's, it's reasonable to, to investigate. Um, and um, with regard to uh, animal testing, um, oh, I guess I need to ask for your second question. Sorry, uh, John, could you just reiterate the second one? Whether, the, whether we might uh, profit from looking for something similar somehow in animal models and whether that would be relevant to, to our... So, so, you know, I remember the saying in the field were saying, hey, it doesn't matter, you know, small or large lesion, you know, if it works, it works for both. Yeah, and um, and it kind of, and this was kind of a, a big, uh, <laughs> big hit argument. You can kill everything, but you know, it's very intuitive though. Uh, but it might not be true, um, as we as we see that you know with this unilateral uh, uh, actually a model here with this glibenclamide uh, 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 approach, you know, and here also sparing uh, might play actually a considerable role whether a protective agent is actually effective or not. So going forward to answer your question, yes, I think the animal models could take into account those um, principles, you know, and, and doing more elaborate. We cannot do that in human, you know, to have particular uh, studying the, the, the interaction between the, the lesion uh, uh, affected network and the recovery related network. This has been, you know, nicely illustrated in reviews, and in a way, we do that too. But <laughs> it needs to be, of course, worked up. And this is when, when it gets really interesting uh, more. And I think this would be a contribution animal models could 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 provide. I'd like to ask a question. So, if you work in a pharmaceutical company, uh, before you can uh, run your screen with the full deck million compounds, you have to convince somebody higher up the food chain that the assay that you're using is translatable to the clinic, that it's biologically relevant. And number one, first question, do we have any reason to believe that rodents are a translatable model for human spinal cord injury? Do we have a good reason? I think, they, I think they have a good reason. Um, I guess they are much better than their reputation. <laughs> it's just that, that the way we use the animal models in the past has not been uh, good, you know, for a lot of reasons, you know, also false incentives in, in publishing and doing stuff, what we're doing. And, and so, <clears throat> so this has been a problem for sure. Um, but the animal models, if you look, for example, what is actually conserved reportedly, you know, there are quite, quite a number of principles which are matching, you know, the principle of penumbra, for example, others too, you know, they, they are there in both sides, you know, also cortical spreading, depre spreading depression, for example, is, is also observed in, to the same degree. We look, uh, our here research impetus is, is looking for, for, for immunosuppression or, or immunodeficiency after injury. And this is interestingly also quite similar in terms of, you know, the time kinetics after spinal cord injury. So there are more things overlapping than, than we think, but of course we we'll need to still be very careful. Uh, um, um, but I think banning animal models or, or animal models are valid, are informative and, and are good. They cannot do everything, but I guess they, I would close with they are better than their reputation. Okay, so I'm not arguing against animal models, that's for sure. But I wonder yes, I if to understand the kind of, astonishing images that you just showed of the spinal cord with, with it looked like many centimeters of, of severe abnormality, but still not so severe, uh, mm -hmm. at least motor outcome, to, to really understand uh, the kind of variability. Do we need this more seriously 
use the kind of models that like Brian Noga Labs lab uses with larger, like, like mini pictures, something like that. Is, does a larger fraction of the resources that are being spent on spinal cord injury need to be used on some more intermediary animals where we could have a better understanding of the these these variability and the complexities that you might only be able to see in a larger animal? Good question. I, I have no, no definitive answer, um, but likely yes. And besides using those animal models, also longer follow-up um, would be required, I guess. You know, usually we tend to say four weeks would be good to see an effect uh, in a way, or it's published that way. But two months for sure would be more, much more insightful to get to get a complete picture. So having longer observational windows would be for sure helpful. Um, stroke <laughs> again has been uh, yeah has been hit very hard with this kind of three days uh, observational time windows, which were kind of absurd. What, what can you say? Obviously, um, and um, so I guess this would for sure help to extend the, 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 the window, we follow those animals. And if we have key findings um, to be reproduced in, in larger animal studies, this would be for sure helping too. But in a way I would propose outlier research, outlier research, you know, not just trying to uh, having of course an average effect, but learning more from outliers. So usually outliers is kind of feared, you know, because it will, <laughs> will, will, will make bad things to your statistics. But on the other side, um, this is probably where we can learn the most, you know, and we have outliers also in animal models, even in mouse models, you know, and then going into that, I think would be quite insightful. So it's not necessarily requiring um, uh, large animal models, but it's mostly trying to learn from those outliers more, I guess. I know it's 12 o'clock Vance, but uh, I really like the concept of reversible axonal injury. I don't know what you think, uh, Jan, but, uh, in traumatic brain injury, Dr. Bramlett and I and colleagues actually showed that uh, using uh, amyloid uh, precursor protein as a tracer for axonal pathology, that early on we saw a large number of um, axons showing APP positive um, damaged axons. But after you let the animal live over time, those particular uh, areas of damage, um, some went away. So it's great direct evidence that in that particular model, the external capsule after uh, TBI, that there was more severe damage and after a period of time, it looked like that damage went away. So uh, what do you think about that concept um, in spinal cord injury? I mean, I can only speculate, uh, honestly. Um, I think it's, it holds true because we still have some unexplained you know, degeneration occurring even remote from the lesion site. So um, if we do MRIs above the lesion, um, and this is again the work done by uh, Patrick I find at the time you see remarkable atrophy occurring and this cannot only be explained by valerian degeneration as you know it's rather symmetric so um, so, so also these remote areas uh, somewhat is, is happening there it could be indeed also this kind of uh, axonal injury uh, some of which is actually did, um, resolving um, some of if it's severe enough these macrophages actually may trigger also um, um, longer term uh, uh, deficits. But yeah, um, obviously we don't, we, we of course need to know more also what this transient functional um, injury could mean in terms of, you know, what type of function is being entertained by those fibers. But, but this is being coming from a different field, from the EF field. I think it, it, this is, these are principles. And, and I think they could also play, of course, a role also after traumatic um, uh, lesions as well. Thank you, great talk. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. It was a great talk. And I think we've all given lots of things to think about and it's gonna have an impact on how we and others uh, do our research in the future. So uh, great to have you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you.